Okay, we have seen that the integral over a closed curve uh, of in various situations is zero if it's something that's the derivative of, of a single valued function. And remember that excluded log, that was equal to zero. Um, that was one way to prove, but there was just a direct calculation that when we did like the circle of radius a, that that was equal to zero. Well, it turns out that it's incredibly general, this closed curve phenomenon. And I want to give you um, a proof of this modeled after um, the proof that I have of Green's theorem. If you look on my videos of, for a proof of Green's theorem, it's not the standard proof in most books of Green's theorem. But it's, I think it's more conceptual than most. And um, you don't need to know that proof, but I'm going it, to, it'd be helpful to refer to it because I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. Okay. The basic idea, so we're not really going to base it on that proof, we're going to emulate it. The basic idea is to do a microscopic version, version of a closed contour integral. And what that means is I'm going to take some point z naught in the plane, and uh, I'm going to exaggerate how big this thing is, but I'm going to take a box that's centered at z naught with, it's going to be a square with side length h. Okay? And I'm going to go ahead and go counterclockwise, because that's usually the positive direction around there. And I'm just going to take the integral, so let's call that c sub h, curve sub h. And I'm going to look at the integral over c sub h of some random function of complex number f of z dz. And I'm not assuming anything about it quite yet. Okay. Now, the microscopic is supposed to suggest that I'm going to take the limit as h goes to 0 of that guy. So that's going to tell you really near that point, what are closed contours doing? What are closed curves doing there? Is there something interesting we can get out of that? Now, that in itself wouldn't be very smart because as the size of this thing goes to zero, this thing should die. Maybe unless uh, this thing's blowing up as you get towards z naught, this should go to zero because just because just because the length of the curve is going to zero. Okay, but um, what I can do, I can divide. It turns out to be smart to divide by the area of the closed curve. So this is actually the closed curve integral per unit area. And then it's the microscopic version of that. So the limit as h goes to zero. And we're going to see why per unit area and maybe not per, like per, uh, per unit perimeter. OK. So let's do that. OK. And here's the other thing we're going to do is that since it's such a small curve, let me redraw it up here where I can save it. Since it's such a small curve, I'm going to use the midpoint approximation to that integral. Uh, and I'm not going to use like a whole bunch of midpoints on each side. I'm just going to use the single midpoint on each side. That would be a pretty terrible approximation to the integral uh, if I if we're a macroscopic thing. If I didn't take h goes to zero, but because h goes to zero, the lengths of these little segments are actually going to going to zero, and it turns out to be fine. Okay. So the midpoint approximation. I'm going to put this limit h goes to zero under h squared in front of everything. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take uh, f uh, on the right hand side of that guy. That's z naught plus h over two. That's right here. Okay, so I'm taking again. This is just this is back to the Riemann sum definition. This is why I did that of the uh, the integral. Uh, here's f at that point, and then I just multiply by the length of that whole side. Now usually I would segment it up into tiny little bits and add one f value for each tiny little bit times the delta z's for all the tiny bits. But as I said, I'm doing a really uh, loose approximation, and it's going to be fine because I'm going to take the limit as h goes to 0. OK, so what's the delta z here? OK, I'm going a distance h, but it's in the imaginary direction. So the delta z is just ih. OK, um, now plus, and now I'm going to go over, I'm going to take this into account because they're going to end up being paired. Here, it's z0 minus h over 2. Notice these are real changes in the, the input to f. Uh, and then times, oh, this guy's going downhill, but that's a minus ih. OK, so each, each time I'm just taking function value times the delta z. Really, really a lot like one variable calculus. Okay. 
In fact, if I just ignored that I was a, a complex number, this would start to look just a lot like a Riemann sum calculation. Okay, in that context. Okay, now I got have the, the top and bottom though. Okay, uh, f of z naught plus ah. Now here I go from from z naught I go up halfway, and up means add an i h over two. Okay, what's that going to be paired with? That's times the delta z up here, which is just minus h. And then one more on the bottom. That start from z naught and then subtract ih over 2, and then times just h. OK, so all four of those things, times 1 over h squared, limit as h goes to 0. OK, so what's going to happen with that? Um, looks like I, it seems to be telling me I'm about to run out of time, which is silly. OK, um, but maybe I'll divide this into two sections. OK, what we're going to do is we're going to do some algebra with this, and it's going to come out um, beautifully to have to do with the complex derivative of f of z. And my screencast is worrying me, so I'm going to pause it right now and split it up into two videos.